Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to hear your word once again. Without it, we would be sunk, Father. And we thank you for this Bible college. We ask right now that you would bless the pulpit, bless the message, open our hearts, prepare us, and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, um, I don't think we ever recommended the book for this class, did we? No. Here it is. I know that we're like four or five weeks into the class. I would like you to buy this book. And this book, uh, I've been reading this book for about 14 years. This to me is the, one of the best missions books you'll ever find. And what's good about it, it has maybe eight, nine, ten pages on every missionary that you could ever think of. It's called From Jerusalem to Irian Jaya. And it's really a phenomenal book. Some people do not like to read one and two hundred page books on missionaries. But this will give you four or five pages and it will give you the highlights of a person's life. And I would say this book has been like a companion of mine. I even take it over seas sometimes so I remember the stories in here. Okay? So I know it's, you don't have to buy it, but I, I recommend it highly. And if you buy it and show it to me in class, we'll even give you a bonus <laughs> on your grade. <laughs> no, really, I just think that this book will be a great addition to anybody's library. And if you're ever, uh, obviously, you might have a little interest in missions. Maybe you don't. If you don't have any interest in missions, I don't know what you're doing here. Um, obviously, I, 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 this is a cross-cultural missionary class, Jesus Willichek. So... <laughs> Uh, don't hide in the corner over there. I know this is being live streamed on the internet, but it means nothing to me at all. From Jerusalem to Irian Jaya. And uh, it's just a great book. It starts all the way back with the Apostle Paul, the early centuries of the Roman Empire, and goes all the way to the present with uh, Dr. Cho in Korea. And so it's very current. And it goes continent to continent, time periods. Uh, it really shows you the effects of some of these uh, missionary movements like the Moravians. <clears throat> There's a lot of things about missions that people have never heard about. Like, who, what do you think is the most effective mission group that has ever been uh, in the world? Wrong. What? No. I mean, as far as a, as far as a mission church and missions movement, the Moravians, and second to them was Sudan Interior Mission, SIM. And uh, how many of you ever heard of SIM? I mean, you heard of it? Uh, how many of you know who started it? See? Yeah, there's so much, there's so much to learn about cross-cultural missions. Rowland Bingham and uh, Walter Gowans' mother. We'll talk about them a little bit tonight, but Really, there's very little that's understood about the history of missions. And if you don't understand the history of missions, it, it can be kind of like a, a, a vacuum in the mind when it comes to missions and talking about missions. So tonight, we're going to talk in tonight's class, and I don't know how far we'll get with it, but the uh, eternal purpose and then the call of God and what it has to do, how it relates to cross-cultural missions. And by the way, Cross-cultural missions is simply, we're not just talking about uh, an American going to uh, South America or Africa. It can be right in a city. You could, you could be evangelizing people that are Spanish-speaking. You could be uh, cross-culturing almost anywhere nowadays because our, our country, our nation, our cities are so, uh, like Pastor Morley says, come to London, you'll find every people group in the world there. I mean, every, everybody's in London. It's, it's amazing. And you don't have to go very far to meet Middle East people, people from Iran, Iraq, Africa, Australia, South America, just everywhere. So cross-cultural missions does not necessarily mean you have to go overseas. It can be right into a neighborhood, right, right into a neighborhood. And it's totally different than how you think and the way you dress and the language that you use. That could even be in America, by the way. 
You can even go in America, and that can, that can happen and very easily. So we want to talk about the eternal purpose. I think if I've been studying this for 30 years, this topic. <laughs> Just joking. Come on. Lighten up a little. No, I've been looking at this for the last three days very extensively, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, but actually, it's been 30 years. Actually, uh, I'm going to teach a weekend about this in Finland. Uh, it'll be the weekend before Budapest, and it'll be all on the eternal purpose of God. And really, it's a, it's a fantastic subject. Many people, you know, we were talking today, in uh, myself, Pastor Schaller, and Pastor Love, many people have a lot of trouble in their life because they miss this. The trouble is because they're just not in God's eternal purpose. And they, don't, they can't figure it out. They can't pick it up. They're trying to figure out why this is happening, what's going on in the marriage, what's happening in the family, what's going on with me, why is nothing working out, this job, that job, this location, that location, this problem, that problem. In all reality, it's, very, it's a very simple solution. They're not in the eternal purpose of God for their life. And God has a way of letting things, he, he loves you so much, he lets things happen to you to redirect you into his purpose. I mean, what, you know, can you imagine? You get saved and the church says, we don't want you around. Acts chapter 9. You have revelation from God and the church says, get out of here. We don't trust you. But that was so Paul would have a mission instead of making his home in Jerusalem. Imagine if all the apostles accepted him. And he was welcomed with open arms and banners flying. Would he have ever gone to the Gentiles? Would he have ever gone to the nations? No. He had to be driven out in that way. And every time he tried to settle someplace, the Holy Spirit says, Separate unto me Saul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to do. Acts 13, 1, 2, and 3. And when people are not well grounded and well taught, oftentimes they don't pick that thing up. They don't pick it up. And uh, they don't see it, and they really end up having very little fellowship with God. And by the way, we will be saved and go to heaven, but if we are not in God's eternal purpose, there will never be maximized fruit, nor the presence of God, nor the contentment of God, nor the peace of God, nor the joy of God. There will be none of those things. We'll be saved, we'll go to heaven, and we might, we might because of our great ability that we have uh, in the things of God sometimes, or with the phraseology and whatnot, we might be able to convince ourselves and other people that we are in God's purpose, but we're not. And God knows, and it's kind of like he's such a gentleman with patience. He's just waiting for people to get it right. So it's very important that this idea of eternal purpose and this subject of eternal purpose it is, it is, I think, one of the key doctrines in the scriptures. And how important. So Matthew chapter 26. Let's turn and look there. We're going to talk about, we're going to define what eternal purpose is. We're going to talk about the five sources of eternal purpose. We're going to talk about seven keys to eternal purpose. We're going to talk about seven contrasts in an eternal purpose. We're going to talk about seven oppositions to an eternal purpose and a number of other things. And I think, really, um, I can study this and then preach about it, think about it, and just keep re uh, rehearsing it in my mind because it is so key, as, as you see in the scriptures. What if Joseph fought his brothers when they tried to put him into Egypt? Egypt was the eternal purpose for Joseph, to go to Egypt. You know? What if Ruth did not go with Naomi? There would have been no David. Okay? I mean, think about it, how key the purpose is in our lives. And uh, Matthew 26, even the disciples, and it and it's, gives me a lot of hope, the disciples had no idea many times what God's purpose was. Imagine God calls you and you spend the rest of your life as a money changer. You never get up out of the receipt of custom. Jesus calls you and you continue fishing. He's called you, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men, you don't go. And you get entangled in your own net. A lot of Christians are entangled in their own nets. It's an interesting subject. Entangled in my own net. And they don't go. 
and he never becomes the Pentecost preacher. It's interesting. Never goes back to Jerusalem to build the temple, Ezra. And what happens? There's, there's a, incredible results. We always, oh yeah, we'll go, I will do it, don't worry about it. Really? He may do it, but without you. And you, will never, you and I will never experience what we could with God. So Matthew 26, now that I've introduced this slightly, it says, verse 6, Now when Jesus was in Bethany, the house of Simon the leper. Some people believe this man was, could have been Judas' father. Because Judas was from Bethany. And uh, he was the only non-Galilean. Maybe he, had, he copped an attitude because, I, don't, I'm not, I, I can't prove this. Maybe he copped an attitude because Jesus didn't heal somebody in his family. It's very interesting. Very interesting. So I'm not saying it's an absolute. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at food at meat. When his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? <laughs> they already said what they thought the purpose was, a waste. To what purpose is this waste? For Listen to human reason. This ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Now, you can find this story in, Math, in Mark 14 and in John chapter 12. And there's, in Mark chapter 14 and John 12, you will find this portion of Scripture. And there's a progression that takes place here, and I'll give that to you. Are you with me? Are you sure? Okay. First of all, it seems like Judas started this. Very clear. He's the one that started this. And then when somebody starts something, it's very interesting how people just go along with it. And three things took place here. Number one, are you with me? Yes. Number one, they had indignation within themselves. You know, before a problem starts, somebody always has a problem inwardly. Indignation within themselves. And if you read those other portions of scriptures, you'll find that it says that, not just here, but there too. They had indignation within themselves. They, within, something happens in me, okay? And when somebody's walking and living in God's purpose, sometimes I can have like an attitude about that. Either because I'm not experiencing God's purpose, or because I look at them and I'm jealous or envious. The second thing that happened, if you read these three portions, Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12, is you'll see that they started to murmur among themselves. First the problem's in me, then I tell you. And then the third aspect is they attack the woman. Okay? They verbally attack her. By the way, all this is happening in front of Jesus. Are you listening? Indignation in, inside of them. Then they are murmuring with a low undertone. And then they accuse the woman. It's a three-step procedure. Whenever you find slander or accusation, you'll always find something wrong with somebody inwardly. And they don't know how to deal with it. They don't cast it down. And they end up talking to themselves first about it. Then they talk to other people. And then... There's a conspiracy against this precious woman. Are you with me? Hmm? We're going to relate this to the purpose of God, but it's important what takes place. Oh, they had a good reason, didn't they? This ointment could have been sold for much. By the way, this is the only woman that was spirit-led. The others in Matthew 28 came to the tomb to anoint him. He was gone. He was gone. He had risen. She's the only one that heard from God. The others didn't. They went to the tomb to anoint his body. He wasn't there. He said, he said she did this for my what? My burial, right? She has done this for my burial. And it's a memorial too, but she's, she's done this ahead of time. It's, it's interesting. 
And all those women had great hearts, but they didn't have good timing. Can I tell you something? You can have a good, you can have a good heart with God and not know the timing of God in things, not know the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you come three years late, one month late, two days late, four days early, one year early, you know, and it's like interesting. So it says, Jesus said, for this ointment, he didn't say it, but they said, this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. This is a great answer for all those people that want to help the poor all the time and think that's the thing they're supposed to do. No, the thing you're supposed to do is, is minister to Christ. All right? Not be giving everybody 50 bucks so they can shoot heroin in their veins. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? You're causing this woman a lot of trouble. For she has wrought a good work on me. For the poor, you, for you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she has poured out this ointment on my body, she did it for my what? See how she knew what she was doing. They didn't. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman has done be told for a memorial of her. Imagine that. Everywhere the gospel is preached, and, and we're reading it tonight, aren't we? Everywhere the gospel is preached, what she did will be a memorial, a gospel memorial. And they said this is a waste, right? They were troubling her. They were indignant, murmuring, attacking, troubling her, and they wouldn't leave her alone. Okay? We could have sold. They weren't going to sell it and give it to the poor. Who were they kidding? They probably were going to go to town and buy some brand new clothes or some food. I don't know what they were going to do. I like what, I like what he says here. There's another portion of scripture in Mark 14 and in John 21. It says she's done what she could. So think about what Jesus says about this woman. She's done a good work on me. When you're in God's purpose, you always do a good work on Christ. Okay? It will be a gospel memorial, and she's done what she could. That's why you never criticize what somebody else is doing, because maybe they've done, they've done what they could. Oh, yeah, you're not doing enough. Well, when did you become Jesus? He said she's done what she could. They were murmuring, indignant, looking at what she was doing, saying it was a waste. Are you with me? Saying it was a waste. He says, this is a good work. This is on me. She did it for my burial. By the way, she was doing a work on the body of Christ. Isn't that interesting? What you do on, in the body of Christ is a memorial. What you do outside of the body of Christ is a waste. See, I don't like that. That's just what the Bible says. She did it on him. She did it for his burial. He called it a good work. He said it will be a memorial. You know, a lot of people spend a lot of time and a lot of money on things that have nothing to do with God's purpose, God's person, and God's body. They just they spend a lot of exercise, a lot of time, and a lot of things on everything. And really, that's really the waste, isn't it? They said what she was doing a waste, and in reality... What they were saying and doing was a waste. What they were saying and doing was a complete waste of their words. So we see that uh, she had a purpose. Her purpose was to minister to Christ and to minister to his body. That was her purpose. That was her purpose. And I, and I believe that without a doubt that if we are ministering to Christ and ministering to the body, that we are living in an amazing purpose with God. And I think it's something that is missed so often by many people. So Jesus says what she's done has a purpose. And it will be a what? Memorial, right? A memorial. Wherever the gospel is preached, this little act that she did, everybody's going to know about it. Because she did it on him. She did it for his burial, it, and she did it with a pure heart, and she did it with an eternal purpose. 
She was led by God. And so his own men, his own disciples are involved in the murmuring and in indignation. You've got to read all portions of the scripture. It was not just Judas, but there was murmuring in, in the house. So Jesus is in the house and he's probably uh, kind of surprised. Why trouble you the woman? She's wrought a good work on me. So when we're in the purpose of God, we may be misunderstood by even believers. I had somebody say to me one time, I think you do too much when it comes to these African churches. I didn't respond. I just turned around and walked away because I know it was Satan. It was Satan. Like, what, Are you going to tell me what I should and should not do when it comes to ministering and helping people overseas? Really? Especially since you have never been there. You don't even know what you're talking about. You have no idea about anything. So I, don't even, I won't even bother responding to that. Like why? It's a waste of vocal cords. It's a waste of, it's a waste of formulating words in the mind and expressing them from the mouth. You don't deserve an answer. Excuse me. I'm on my way because I don't converse with Satan when he's using your mouth. I didn't say that, but I just thought that and turned and walked. and was very nice about the whole thing with a smile. So, the purpose of God. They didn't understand it. Those in the house didn't understand it. Simon's fa uh, family didn't understand it. The disciples didn't understand it. Judas did not understand it. And there it was. She was living in the perfect purpose of God. And that's amazing. And what, what you do in the purpose of God will be a what? A what? A memorial to you. A memorial to the gospel. And so we can't evaluate what we do. You know how people evaluate things? I mean, can you imagine that you could pray a prayer and it could be a prayer that changes a family? Uh, I was reading about John Scudder today from this book. John Scudder went to India and he had 10 children and all 10 children became missionaries to India. And 40 Scudders were missionaries to India. Grandchildren. Children and grand... 40 Scudders, 40 people from John Scudder's loins did missionary work in India and they spent 1,000 missionary years there. The 40 of them. That's... Talking 20, 25 years apiece. One man decides to walk with God. Not only was he evangelistic and a preacher, he was a doctor, like Hudson Taylor. Okay? And it's amazing. It's amazing what a person, what, what a person can do. And, and, and we, don't, we just don't realize uh, what God can do with individuals. And we get caught up in so many temporal purpose situations. And... God uses it, and God gives us a measure of fruit. But I think it's important to understand that in God's purpose, it may be misunderstood by people. It, it may be looked at as being without any value. It may be seen as something that's not important. But it really, it really is. Do you, think, do you think there were people that prayed that we would come to Baltimore? Hmm? Yes, there were. I mean, maybe a hundred years ago, they would pray that there would be a word of God um, uh, mission to Baltimore. Of course. And what about those prayers? Do they, do they not count in the purpose of God? Are they not ointments on the body of Christ? Are they not important? Do they not have purpose? Of course they do. So we begin to evaluate like human beings. Oh, well, compared to what they're doing in Washington, what are we doing? A lot. Yeah, like, like it's a whole other kingdom, if you don't mind me saying. It's another kingdom. You know, while people are debating, debating health insurance, we're being healed by God. Why don't they like, I wish somebody would stand up in one of those things and say, like, has anybody ever heard of the great physician? Let's stop debating and let's get on our knees and pray to the great physician. 
and maybe we would get healed and then know what to do about insurance. Hmm. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have it. I, I, I say it's okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if they, got, they could get on their knees and pray to the great physician. They could get healed and see the power of God and then get some wisdom you know, on how to uh, do what they're supposed to be doing. So the purpose of God, and she understood it. She was in it. Even his own disciples were not. And we can see that happening. It's a, growth, it's, a growing, it's a growing process. It's something progressive. You know, something progressive. They, they didn't have a clue many times about what was going on. They didn't. Send her away! Matthew 15, send her away! Right? And what are you doing talking to this woman? Well, I'll talk to this woman, she'll get saved, and she'll bring a whole town to meet me in John chapter 4, where all you did was go to town and get something to eat. And all you brought back was a dirty mouth because you haven't got a handkerchief. I don't know. You came back with some food or something, right? She came back with a whole city. And you're asking me, why are you talking to her? You missed it. And they were disciples. So it can happen to any of us. I mean... Like we were saying today, like, wow, there's anything that I get shocked at that somebody does, I can do it myself. Don't ever think that it couldn't be you. You could kill somebody tonight. Don't say you couldn't, because you got an old sin nature like I do. Don't, don't sit there with an innocent face. I, I would never do that. You'd be surprised what you could do, motivated by the old sin nature of the devil. So... Let's define what eternal purpose is. What is, what is. How do we define the purpose of God? The word prothesis, I will spell it for you, for those who want to know. For those who do not want to know, bear with us that want to know. P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. Prothesis. P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. Prothesis. P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. Or protithemi, P-R-O-T-I-T-H-E-M-I, protithemi. And it's a very interesting word, and it's very important to define it. Why? Well, really, in the, in the Greek language, the word purpose means where you are placed. Protithemi, you are before God. Where you are placed, where you, I've been set in place, my position. Your purpose really is where you've been placed in your position. My position. And of course we know that as a believer we are in who? In Christ. So purpose really is where I've been placed, my position, God's design for my life. God's design for my life, God's placing, where God's intentions are for me to be. A very important word. So, where I've been placed, where I've been set, my position, God's design, God's intention for my life. It really speaks of the will of God. What is the will of God for my life? God's will my life and really to understand that and three three I would say three three parts to the purpose number one we are in Christ number two we are in the father so we have his provision his protection and his authority and number three we're in the body by the Holy Spirit so this is our place, our position. We're in the Father, we're in the Son, and we're in the Holy Spirit. We're in the Father, we're in the Son, and we're in the Holy Spirit. Or we're in the body by the Holy Spirit. By the way, did you know that you were placed in this church, if this is your church or whatever church you go to, as I'm talking to the Internet, that is the, it's the Holy Spirit that's supposed to place you somewhere. You don't place yourself there. I think I'm going to go to that church. 
It's in my neighborhood. They're all Greeks. They're all Italians. They're all Africans. They're all whatever, Indians. Okay? They're all, what island are you from? St. Thomas. They're all from St. Thomas. No. We, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit we are baptized into the body, into one body. The Holy Spirit places us where we're supposed to be. It's not my decision. It's my decision to say yes or no to the Holy Spirit. But God has placed me in greater grace. It happened uh, 33 years ago. 1977. Is, that what, is it 2010? Thank you. I don't think much about years too often. It's too late for that. Right, Pastor Jerry? <laughs> it's too late for that. God placed me there. It's like, and that means whether I like it or I don't like it. Whether things work the way I want them to or they don't work the way I want them to. Who's the pastor or who, who, who's, who's not the pastor? Whatever, you know? It's like, come on, you know? I just can't seem to get along with people. So what? What does that mean? God's placed me in this body. Are you with me? And uh, that seems to be something that's been sealed by God. So I don't sit around questioning or evaluating everything that's happened to me and saying, I wonder, you know, whatever. So, and this is where I, I'm going to find my purpose because purpose is where I've been placed. So where you've been placed is where you find your purpose because your purpose is where you've been placed. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's really simple. And if you, and if you are somehow missing that, maybe you're not, you're, you really don't understand that you are in the Father, in the Son, and in the body by the Holy Spirit. And so you let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what to do. Sometimes I meet people and they say, I don't know what to do with my life. Wow. Now if they're a young believer, that's one thing. Well, I'm, I don't know. I feel like I'm useless. Or I don't know what, you know, what is there for me. What is there for you? Minister to Christ. Minister to the people in the church. And minister to the lost. What else would you like to do? Is that enough for you for a lifetime? Minister to Christ. Minister to his body. And minister to lost people. What, what else would you like to do? You want a title? Position? A job? Or something? Just do what is very easy to do. Which is the first thing fruits the first thing to do and then by the way why would God lead you if you don't do the important things like if God has led me to study the Bible to pray to be involved in the body and to win souls why would I why would I get confused about where I should what I should be doing if I don't do those things that are already told me are you gonna tell a child of yours something beyond what you've already told him to do and he's not doing it no so God has already told us the things that are very important to do, the essentials, the key things. If I just do those, I'm guaranteed I'll know all these other things. I don't sit around saying, I wonder what I should do with my life. I wonder where I should go. I wonder if I should be in this geographical location or that. I wonder what part of the ministry God wants me in. I wonder this and I wonder that. Well, now you become wonder man or wonder woman. <laughs> and your whole life is a big bewilderment. And God is saying it's so easy if you'll just come. Fellowship with me, fellowship with the body, and go after people that don't know me. That's our whole life. I knew that the day I got saved. I knew that it was important for me to read the Bible, find the church, and win the lost. That to me was Christianity. And I don't think it should get more complicated after that, should it? You know what happens? We leave our first love. And we get so complicated and, uh, with our inward reasoning and outward evaluations and computerized advanced technological minds. And God said, be a dummy, you're better off. Just be a dummy. But respond to me. By the way, be dumb to the devil and respond to me. Hmm? The purpose. What is the purpose of the believer? Now let me give you some sources for the purpose and then we will go into some key things that are the, I know are the purpose of God. Here's a, a sources of the purpose. Look at the life of Christ, number one. What is the purpose of the Son of God? 
He came to reveal who God was, right? He came to reveal, he came to unveil the perfect God and the perfect man. So the source of eternal purpose is going to be the life of Christ himself. Couldn't I just follow the life of Christ in the Gospels and in the Bible and figure out purpose? What was Jesus' purpose? He came to seek and save the lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to uh, serve people. He came to reveal his Father in heaven. He came to, uh, I mean, think about it. I mean, so the purpose, all I have to do is look at the life of Christ and I think I would be able to understand what my purpose is. It's, what was his purpose? Am I in him? Yes. Well, wouldn't it be good to take a look at his purpose then? Huh? Because if, if I'm in him and I understand his purpose, then I will not be so confused about my what? So the life of Christ, and you can see it through the Gospels. Just read the Gospels and, and, and read about it, and you can find him everywhere in the Bible. But I, I love reading the Gospels and see the way Jesus Christ moved and made decisions and what he did and how he ministered in his life in practicality, personal practicality on the earth. Number two, a source of my purpose is the finished work. Why would I say that? Because the finished work has redeemed me and the finished work has set me free and He's given me that position. I'm in the Father, in the Son, and in the Spirit, and in the body by the Spirit because of the finished work. So the finished work is a source of my purpose. The finished work of Christ on the cross is a great source for my purpose. There is great authority that comes from the finished work. I'm not going to fellowship with my old man and try to figure out my purpose. By the way, do you know that when I live in the old man, I never know the purpose of God even though I have one? I'll never know it. I'll never know it. I live in my old man. I live in the world. I live in the flesh. I'm not going to know my purpose. So the finished work. Number three, third source of my purpose is the Bible. Hey, that's a astounding, that's a astounding thing, isn't it? The Bible. Wow, isn't that amazing? The Bible shows you your purpose. That's why it's good to open it up, isn't it? Pay a little attention to it. I don't know what God wants in my life. When's the last time I read the Bible? About a month ago. Duh. Or duh, duh. Huh. God, read the Bible. Look at the Bible. You'll find your purpose in the Bible. Well, you know, I, I come and I hear the word preached at least twice a week. Well, that's great. So you hear the Bible like an hour a week. What are you listening to the other 167 hours? Huh? No, oh, and I'm in the I'm in the words, a source of my purpose. Number four, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit. The uh, life of the Holy Spirit, the leading, the guiding, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal to me my purpose. My purpose. Number five, fifth source of my purpose is the body of Christ. If I'm not getting it from these things, maybe God is just drawing me into fellowship. Body life. That's where I find... Does the body have a purpose? So if you don't, what do you think you should do? One and one is two. Get around the body. I don't know what my life. I don't know what my purpose is. I go to the Bible. I look at Jesus. I don't know, what about what? Well, hello? Come to the church. The church. Okay? Called out ones. Come to the church and you'll see the purpose of God in the church. And I don't, and obviously many people miss the purpose of God because they are in churches that do not have a purpose. So you find the church with a purpose. That's important for me. I don't, by the way, never make a decision to go somewhere or do something based upon a natural desire. You know? I mean, what, what, are you, what are you doing? You go where you can grow. You go where the purpose of God is revealed. You go where you can get to know Jesus Christ. I don't make decisions about what to do or where to go and eliminate that aspect of my life. 
purpose. The purpose of God. So these are the sources of the purpose of God. And you probably can come up with some others. Those are just ones I was thinking about today. Now, the next thing is which I think is important is uh, I would say this I'm going to give you four, first of all four things and then seven different principles. The four things you'll find in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 6. Okay? Did I say that too fast? Acts 2, 4, 6. Acts 2, 4, 6. Does the internet get that? Acts 2, 4, 6. Okay? If you read the Bible and you see the early church, you'll see they were, there was four things that were very key that they were involved in. They were involved with the Word of God, doctrine. They were involved with prayer. They were involved with body life. And they were involved with soul winning. I mean, can you imagine how, how simple is this? But yet Satan blinds people's minds to the simplicity that's in Christ. He blinds people's minds. He corrupts them from that simplicity. Very interesting how he does that. Makes everything so complicated. But you see the early church, the keys, and you look through the book of Acts, you'll see, even in Acts 19, what's Paul doing? He's preaching the Bible. They're praying. He's got body life. He's moving with ten men. And they're winning the lost. I mean, it's, it's those, four, those are the four foundations for in the purpose of God in the book of Acts. Now, I want to give you, here's, I was thinking about these seven things today, yesterday or 30 years ago, whatever fits your bill. Okay? Are you with me? You can't tell me it's cold out. You got a hood on. My God, I think it's like Africa in here. It's hot. How many of you are hot right now? Like warm. See that? Okay. Blood runs differently. Okay. Here's just seven things that you can think about because sometimes we get so complicated and as we look to the word and we pray and we are in the body and we win the laws, these are seven things that I think are vitally important as seven pillars or seven keys, seven keys to the purpose, the door of the purpose. Number one, one always comes first, right? Number one, receive from God. Be a receiver. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. As many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Be a receiver of God's word and God's grace. I guarantee if you're a receiver of God's word and God's grace, you will always be in fellowship with his purpose for your life. Are you with me? Just a receiver. Isn't that simple? Not a, I didn't say be a doer, did I? I said be a receiver. Number two, let God love you. 1 John 4, 19 through 21. Not that we loved him, but he first loved us. In the purpose of God, just letting God love me. Every believer needs to let God love them. No matter how they look at themselves, what they think about themselves, what they think they deserve or do not deserve, number two, let God love you. That is a key to God's eternal purpose for my life. Number three, have faith in God. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Okay? Faith in God. If I receive from God, let him love me and trust him, I'm going to I guarantee you will not have a problem with the eternal purpose. Are you with me? Yes. Number 4, Philippians 3, verse 10. Know him. Paul said after 30 years of being an apostle, he wanted to know God, personally and progressively. If you think, and I think I know God tonight, I do, but I want to know him more and more. Are you with me? That's the purpose of God. Even in Philippians 3.10, the word that I may know him is in what's known as an infinitive. I'm not trying to get too intricate with tenses of Greek. But the infinitive means it's something progressive and something personal and something that has a purpose. The infinitive always means personal, progressive with a purpose. 
Do you remember that? Personal infinitive. That I may know him is in the infinitive tense. And it means personal, progressive, and has a purpose. My purpose is to know him. And is to be something that is growing and is something very personal. What a verse that is when you think about it. I want to know him. That's personal. I want to know him. That's growing. I want to know him. That's a purpose for my life. It's a great verse. Knowing him and the purpose of God. Number five, I want God to change me. That's a purpose of God. Romans 8.28 and 2 Corinthians 3.17 and 18. I want, I want God to change me. I don't want to stay the same. I want God to change me. Isn't that the purpose of God? It's one of the, he want, to, that I am being changed by God. From glory to glory, He's what? Changing me. Change, remember that song? Changing me. I, being changed by God. Oh. And some people spend 10 years and nothing has ever happened. It's, it's the same person. They got the same struggles, same problems, the same thorns, the same besetting sins. Can't have victory over the same things. Never changed. God's purpose is that I would be changed. And I, I, would, I would get to know God. I'm changed by the Holy Spirit. Next, number six. And by the way, these seven things I have written in my Bible, they're very, they've been very important to me for many years. Number six, I want to reveal him. Galatians 1, 15 and 16. But when God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Paul said I was called by grace from my mother's womb so that he would reveal, unveil his son in me. The purpose of God is that people might see Christ in you. Christ in me. Christ in us. Not see me in me. Not see you in you. See Jesus in you. Amen? Say, well, that's just the way I am. My expression of Jesus, right? As I'm sitting there drunk. You know, or drinking wine or whatever. No, no, no. That Christ might unveil himself in us. And that, and, and that is so clear that people would see us and they would see Christ no matter what I'm doing. Number seven. Galatians 1.24. And they glorify God in me. The eternal purpose of God is to glorify God. Right? Glorify God. Glorify God. That God might be glorified. These are seven keys. So receive Him, be loved by Him, have faith in Him, know Him, be changed by Him, reveal Him, and give Him glory. That they glorify. You notice how Paul said that? What did he say? And they what? They glorified God where? In me. In me. They glorified God in me. And I, and I love that. Now, as we continue on, let me give you seven contrasts. Seven different contrasts when it comes to this particular subject. The purpose of God. I want you to see what a, what a great difference there is depending on which side you're taking. Are you with me, Azerbaijan? Are you with me? Okay. These are seven contrasts. Number one, eternal versus temporal. There's an eternal purpose and there's a what purpose? Temporal purpose. I want to live in that which is eternal or that which is what? Temporal. Temporal needs, temporal desires, temporal. Just everything that's temporal. That which is eternal is far different. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have temporal life? No, eternal life. He was a rich, young, religious ruler. He had, he had things that everybody would want. He was rich. He was young. He was religious. He said, I've done all these things from my youth. And he was a ruler. Those four things. Jesus says, one thing you lack. Give it all away. Sell it all. And follow me. Oh, you... I like how Mark 10, verse 17 says, and he looked at him and loved him. Did you know that? Why do you think Mark 10, 17 says that? Because it was John Mark. It was John Mark that was the rich young ruler. And that's why it's in the personal, first person singular. 
It's the only portion out of all of them where it says, and he looked at him and loved him. John Mark was the rich young ruler. And then he fled naked in the garden. Remember when they came to arrest Jesus? Who's the young man that fled naked? John Mark. Who's the man that went with the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey? Acts 13. His, his pastor was Peter. His uncle was Barnabas. It was John Mark. Who's the one that left Paul? Ran away from Paul like he ran away from the cross, like he ran away from Jesus. Mark ran away from the person of Christ, rich young ruler, ran away from the cross of Christ, Mark 14, and ran away from the gospel of Christ, Acts uh, 15, but Peter brought him back. First Peter 5.13, he calls Mark his son. And then Paul said in 2 Timothy 4.11, bring Mark back to me, He's profitable for the ministry. This is John Mark. This is John Mark. Denied the Lord. Walked away from God. Denied the Lord in the trial. Denied the gospel. Attacked the apostle Paul. And Peter took care of him. Why, why do you think Peter was the best man to handle John Mark? Because he had also recovered from denial. Right? With the comfort, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Comfort them with the comfort that you have received from God. You can comfort others. You can encourage others. You can help others when you've been helped by God. That doesn't mean go out and do something stupid so you can say, now I can help people. Because yes, I just went out and I just got arrested. Now I can help people. They get arrested. No, we, I'm not talking about that. God. Unbelievable. Eternal versus temporal. Next. Second contrast, grace versus religion. When you think about purpose, it's all, 2 Timothy 1, 9, it's in grace. It's not religion. You won't find God's purpose in religion or human work or works. Grace versus religion. And we don't have to talk much about that. We know a lot about that from Galatians. We know a lot about that from the book of Acts, that grace is totally contrary to works and religion. Contrast number three, Jesus versus me when I'm outside of Christ. <laughs> I want to be like the person of Christ. I, I, want, I want Christ's life, Christ to live in me, for me to live as Christ. The opposite of Christ is me, lost. Me, me. Okay? That's me. When I live in me, I don't experience Christ. So there's a great contrast between the person of Christ and the person of me. All right, the old sin nature. Next contrast, faith versus sight. You'll never know your purpose unless it's faith. It's not by sight. By the way, all these are related to purpose. Purpose and grace. Purpose is eternal. Purpose and grace. Purpose in Jesus. Purpose and faith. Okay? Faith versus sight. Faith versus sight. Next, the body versus the world. You want to live in the world, you'll never know the purpose of God. You live in the body, you'll know the purpose of God. Is anybody with me here? Yes. Are you all here? Yes. Hallelujah. Okay, I don't want to just preach to the internet tonight. Body versus the world. The opposite of the body is the what? The world. This is pretty simple. It's not like, you know, people or... It's the world system. Okay? Body life is contrary to the world system. And the world will try to draw you into it. It to get you away from the church, the body. They tried that with the early church. They tried that uh, all through. The, I mean, just you just see it time and time again. Next, the word of God versus human reason. The word of God shows you the purpose of God. Human reason will get us nowhere. That's not reasonable. That's not reasonable. Not reasonable to go to Bible school. Why well, would I want to go to a Bible school if it's not accredited? So you won't become stupid like everybody else. Duh. Who cares about accreditation? We're accredited with heaven. They told me that in, in Ghana. They said, you have to be accredited. You have to go through all this stuff. And you have to teach the Quran. I said, I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's not going to happen. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. They say, well, we'll shut you down. I said, try it. And, they never, and 25 years later, we're still going. No, we're not 
bowing to we're not bowing to Haman. Not bowing to Haman. If you can't, you know, can't oh, get off it, will you? What do I care if the world accredits me? Oh, I just got a badge of honor from the world. <laughs> it's dishonor. It's not honor, it's dishonor. What do I care? I have all those things. I have them in some drawer somewhere. Three degrees. I don't, there are some, I, don't even, I didn't even put them in folders, did I, Lynn? I think they're just like all wrinkled up and spit on. I'm just joking. I'm just, some people get a little nervous about this kind of talk. You know, oh, my God, but I want to, you know, God, may God lead you wherever he leads you. If he leads you to a school, God, but I'm not worried about accreditation. It's the word versus human reason. I'll find my purpose in the word, not in somebody's human reason. Not very reasonable to leave your father in the boat and get out, is it? The word is talking to you on the seashore, and you leave daddy in the boat, and you leave him, the fishing business, and your village and your family, and you're never coming back again. That's radical. Oh, but that was for then. Pastor Israel, that's not for now. That was for then. That was in the old days. We don't do that now. We've got to think things through. I won't, I won't go another step with that. At least I provoke myself. And by the way, uh, Mama Zebedee got saved. And I believe Daddy, Mama Zebedee was at the cross. And Daddy Zebedee had the letter come, so I believe he got saved too. You make some radical decisions based upon the word and not human reason, you'd be surprised who will respond. Because they see you mean business with God. You know, a lot of the world looks at Christians and they laugh because Christians are no, not much different. They're not much different. So they say, why would I want to go to church and become like you? I'm already like you. You drink, I drink. You watch movies, I watch movies. You live in adultery, I live in adultery. You get divorced, I get divorced. So what's the deal? Why should I want to be a Christian? For what? You're not doing anything differently than I'm doing. And that's the case with most of Christianity. And a lot of, you know, they, a lot of Christians, I, Pastor Shallow was talking about this, a lot, of, a lot of Christians are just so fed up with church because all they do is get manipulated and beat up and, and, and robbed in their church of their money. So they just don't even want to go to church anymore. They just feel like they're getting manipulated, they're getting pounded by legalism, and uh, it's all a big game or whatever it is, poly, whatever's going on, and they don't even want to go to church. I don't blame them. Don't blame people for not wanting to go to church when churches are like they are. The word will show me my eternal purpose. My human reason will get me nowhere. And number seven, the spirit versus the flesh. The Holy Spirit will always be in the purpose of God. My flesh <laughs> can never be. Can never be in the purpose of God. My flesh can never be in the the purpose of God. Now, are you with me? Okay. Here's a few things that can keep me from understanding my, this purpose. Number one, I hate to give you lists, but I am. Because I think it's good for learning. Satanic opposition will always be, Satan will always oppose the purpose of God. Okay? If God's purpose is for you to be a businessman, the devil will try to send you on the mission field. How's that one? Right? If God's purpose is for you to be on the mission field, he'll make you successful in your business. The devil will. He's always opposed to the purpose of God. And you can use Ezra chapter 4, verse 5 as a great verse. They tried to frustrate the purpose of God. Those who were opposed to Ezra Try to, so satanic opposition is always resist, always opposing God's purpose. Always. S since the garden. What was he doing in the garden with Adam and Eve? By the way, Eve was, Adam was standing there listening to the devil seduce Eve and did nothing about it. Huh, it's too bad. She failed and she, she bit. She went under. But he was standing there allowing the devil to talk to her. Number two, human ability and works will always oppose the eternal purpose. Human ability. 
And you know how many people are trying to do things through human ability and human works today to try to make planet Earth better? All God has to do is make one little shaking, and there goes a continent. You know? Human ability always opposes the purpose of God. Next, the world system is always in opposition to God's purpose. The world system always opposes God's purpose. The fourth thing, tests and trials will try to confuse us about God's purpose. We will have tests and we will have trials, and they will sometimes take our mind off of God's what? God's purpose. Rather than I, I get to know God's purpose in them, the devil tries to use them to take us away from God's purpose. And guess what? If you're a believer, and I know you are because you're in this class, you're going to have tests and trials the rest of your life. I can't wait till this situation is over. Just turn around the corner. There's another one waiting. Come on, get used to it. Don't be a little crybaby. You know, oh, really, this, this Christianity is too difficult, too tough. I don't know. When's this going to stop? I hope that, I don't, I'm miss on, oh, come on. You know what? It's always going to be that way. It was like that for Paul to the end of his life. How did Jesus' life end? Was there any trials at the end of his life? He's crucified. Paul was, had his head cut off. <laughs> oh, I need a vacation from this stuff. Really? Oh, so why don't you go to Florida and go on a fishing boat and let an earthquake hit? <laughs> or end up in the belly of a whale? Or try to tame a killer shark? Some people are just so stupid, aren't they? Some people are like, we can't understand what happened. What's the name, what, no, what's the name of that animal? Killer whale. What's the first name? Killer. Oh, so you want to play with a killer whale? Then you guess what? You die. What's so difficult? I mean, you know... Come on. You want to play you want to play with the, what's that guy that used to that the animal guy? Remember he always be on TV do these crazy things with crocodiles and Remember that guy they call him I don't know. Didn't 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 he get hit he was it Stingray. Stingray. Isn't that sad? No, he's stupid. It's not sad. It is sad that he's stupid. But you know what? You want to play with those you want to grab cobras by the head and you want to you know, go on TV and show your power over animals, then you're playing with something that's interesting, all right? Wow. Tests and trials are there to reveal God's purpose. Number five, the task God gives you, the, in the tasks that God gives us in our life, we, f we have God's purpose in the middle of them. So sometimes we say, how long is it going to take to plant the church? How long? How long is it going to take to go to Bible school? Four years? Oh, what a t no, it's God's purpose. Next. And so sometimes the task will try to be in opposition. We'll think that, I, can't, I don't know I, I don't know if I can do this. You know, The task that God gives us. I, 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 I thought about having a task to plant churches in 55 countries in Africa. We're in about 26 so far, halfway through. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm moving towards a certain age now. So I gotta, we got to get going. <laughs> or somebody does if I'm not here. You got it? I told, I told them in Africa, I tell them all the time, listen, I said 55 countries. Did you hear me? And I said, and I'll say it. I'll somehow, when you get to heaven, if it isn't done, I'll talk to you. <laughs> Lovingly, but I'll talk to you. I'll ask God if I can talk to you. No, I know, I know. But, but there's a task, but I don't want to miss God's eternal purpose in trying to perform the task. Next, time is always opposed to that which is eternal, the eternal purpose of God. We'll, we'll start thinking about time. How long is it going to take? How old am I getting? How many years have I been doing this? Time can be a, something that seems to oppose the purpose of God. And finally, the last one, results. Whether they're good or bad. I mean, you know what? That doesn't, they do not define the purpose of God. Some people have had what you would call no result, very little results. Some people have had great results, but those results, good or bad, do not define the eternal purpose of God. Are you with me? Okay, now I want to just uh, 
read something interesting to you I think is great. You don't have to take notes. You can just buy the book. Isn't that good? could just buy the book. Now, um, in, are you ready for this? I just want you to listen to this or whatever you, whatever you want, whatever the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I, just, I was reading this today, and I just put some things down that I thought were important. Failure, death, and despair marked the beginning of Sudan Interior Mission. A vast region in the southern, south of the Sahara, had not one missionary that ever went to it. Imagine that. Not one missionary was ever, ever sent to that area. 60 million people and no one ever went. Okay? One man named Rowland Bingham, <coughs> very dynamic man, and this man was responsible as he looked to God for the most, one of the most dynamic works in the history of the church. It's one of the largest mission operations going even to this day. Walter Gowans' mother, who was a Canadian, had prayed. She sent him to England, and they could find no missionary group that wanted to go to the Sudan. So Gowans' mother prayed more and more, and all of a sudden, Rowland Bingham responded, her son, Walter Gowans, and a man named Kent. In 1893, they landed in West Africa. They were told by missionaries in West Africa, listen to this statement, you will never reach the Sudan. Your children will never reach the Sudan, and your grandchildren will never reach the Sudan. It is the most insane mission you could ever think of. Go back. Bingham got malaria. He remained in West Africa on the coast. The 800-mile journey killed Gowans and Kent. The journey killed the both of them. Okay? Bingham went back. In 1893, that was in 1893, Bingham returned to England in 1895 and went to A.B. Simpson's Bible College. In 1898, he married Helen Blair, and her father had a lot of resources, and he helped with the mission. Seven years later, 1900, Bingham and two men made a return to the Sudan. All right? The two died. Bingham went back with malaria. 1902, the third attempt was made. Four men went, three died. Bingham went back again. <laughs> And finally, in 1902, they established their first mission 500 miles in the southern part of the Niger River. In 1928 through 37, after nine years of actually establishing a church there, in that period of time, they had 48 people in the church. War came. In 1941, they went back and they found the 48 had become 10,000 church members with 100 churches. God did something. In 1953, there were 705 churches. In 1978, there was 2,500 churches. In 1982, they had 60 training schools with 3,000 students. Bingham. He died, he went back. They died, he went back. They died, he went back. Now, interesting, listen to this. I thought this was, this was kind of interesting. By the way, he lived to be 70 years old. And uh, everybody was expelled in 1955. 1964, everybody was expelled from the Sudan, too, in the middle. Look, look, at the, look what took place in the middle of it. Number one, they faced sickness and death in the beginning. Number two, they faced a lot of evil manifestations of the devil. In this book, there's some incredible stories about w people walking on the air, people, uh, I mean, spirits, demon spirits. So they had a, it was like a five-year period where they had amazing assault, demonic, visible assault by the devil. The third thing that happened was the war of Italy against Ethiopia. That made a mess of the churches. And the fourth thing that happened in 1970 was Islam expelling all the missionaries. To this day, SIM exists. After all that, fourth, 
four major things. Sickness and death, evil manifestations for a number of years that didn't happen at other times. The war and then Islam. And today, I just I read you what it was today in 1982. I don't know what it is today, but in 1982, there were 60 schools with 3,000 students and over 2,500 churches. 48 people. One dead person after another. What did Roland Bingham have? He had a what kind of, he had a what? He had a purpose, didn't he? His mother had a purpose. I mean, the mother of Walter Gowans had a purpose. Her son died, she kept praying. She was like the encouragement behind all that took place in the Sudan. And all the missionary societies and churches, they said, no, it's a crazy mission. You won't make it. Your children won't make it. And your grandchildren won't make it. Everybody's going to die. Is that so? Another story in this book. I'm not trying to get you to buy it, but you know. <laughs> Hudson Taylor, born in 1832, was converted at 17 years old in 1849. When he was 21 years old, he went to China. A little young, huh? A little young, huh? 21 years old, he went to China. <laughs> Interesting. In 1865, he went to China in 1853. 1865, 12 years later, he and 24 men had evangelized all of China, all of, all of the known regions of China. In 1869, don't forget now, he's born in 1832, so that makes him about 37 years old. For the first time in his life, he understood, 20 years after his conversion, 1849, 1869, he, for the first time in his life, he understood the finished work. It's called The Exchange Life. How many of you took Acts class and read the book? 20 years after he was saved, he understood resting in the finished work that Christ had done at all. His mission took a tremendous change. He returned to China in 1872 after being pretty sick for three or four years. He was paralyzed and went back to England in 1875. In 1876, he returned to China. 1887, back to England and then to North America. In 1905, he returned to China, and he died in China on June 3, 1905, at 73 years old. He, he discipled 1,300 missionaries himself. And they call it the China Inland Mission. Sudan Interior Mission, China Inland Missions. Quite a story about men who understood the purpose of God. So... Father, as we take this break, just help us to continue to receive from God's purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a 10-minute break.